Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure and undeserved honor to uh, introduce Mary Shaw. Um, I believe I first saw her name on a uh, paper when I was a first year undergraduate, a paper in SIG plan notices, those pages between those beautiful sky blue covers that arrived, how I looked forward to those. I read every page of those when I was an undergraduate. Um, I later followed her work on the uh, Alphard programming language um, when we were, I say we as a community, but um, uh, important work by Mary and her colleagues on trying to nail down really what we meant by modularity and what was necessary uh, to actually ensure that that was useful. Um, later, I associated her name with um, taking the term software engineering and actually figuring out how that might mean something and how that then inform what we actually do, what we actually teach, and what we actually expect. Um, the later work on software architecture with their uh, colleague David Garland, um, I, I think changed a lot of people's perception about the structure, not only of programs, but of large systems. And that really influences how we view um, large programs and how they work and how they should work and making that structure meaningful. Uh, most recently, uh, I was very impressed by uh, her reflective talk at the History of Programming Languages conference uh, last year. Um, and I believe the talk today has strong connections with that talk. When I listened to that talk, and when I reflected on the work on software architecture and the early work on software engineering, my real impression was this. Most of us, almost all of us in this community, have been thinking about those things, knew what was being talked about. But when Mary reflected and wrote about those things, it became obvious that she was considering and ended up seeing things that the rest of us missed, things that we really need to think carefully about. So it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce Mary Shaw, someone who sees things the rest of us missed. Thank you very much for that introduction. That's a very kind introduction um, and an excellent summary of, of things that, uh, that I hope I have done as well as you suggested I did. Um, thank you to uh, Where Did Alex Go for, for inviting me to come and, and reprise this talk. It really is very strongly related to the talk that I gave to Hoppel. Um, and I hope it's okay with you, but in the interest of being able to hear the microphone, Alex has assured me that the speaker being adequately distanced uh, from the rest of the audience that uh, I may unmask in the interest of, of being understood. Um, this talk is, uh, is about things that we believe and, uh, and things that are uh, happening in the world that we, uh, we probably ought to be paying attention to. Um, it turns out that one of the ways that I find interesting research problems is by noticing uh, what we are saying to each other about the world and what the world says, um, and noticing the dissonance and trying to pick out uh, the interesting bits of the dissonance. And so this talk is about the dissonance between what we have uh, been telling ourselves for years and what happens in the world, and I hope what, what comes out of it for you is, is uh, reflections on opportunities uh, to find new and interesting research problems. So I'm going to talk about myths and myth conceptions uh, and programming languages. Uh, it is a reprise of the Hoppel talk. There is a paper associated with the talk. It's published in the uh, Proceedings of the ACM on Programming Languages. 
And I didn't put the DOI up here because you don't need to spend time scribbling the DOI down. It's in the abstract. You can look it up and click on it there. So um, let's talk about myths. Uh, myths aren't just false things that you can dismiss. Uh, myths are culturally powerful. There are narratives that help us make sense of our place in the world. Um, and they provide insight related to deep truths. Uh, with some colleagues, I, I previously wrote about myths and their power. Uh, we said that, that a myth isn't something that you can refute. Uh, in its purest form, it's a heroic narrative. Um, it can establish a model for behavior. It can transmit social traditions. Um, and, and that they have an enduring appeal that, that gives you a wish to believe that makes you strongly connected to them, um, even in the face of, of testable evidence to the contrary. So I grew up um, with Greek and Roman and North, Norse mythology. And quite many of you here grew up in other cultures. And I know that you also have myths uh, which are different from mine. Um, and as a particular example, uh, an acknowledgement of our hosts, uh, Emera says of Maori mythology uh, that myths commemorate our ancestors and their origins, that they teach us about the gods, they give us heroes to inspire us. They are a rich blend of fact and fiction and fantastical of religion and philosophy and history. Uh, and they're told and retold and passed through the generations. Um, and I resonate with that in the same way that I resonate with the myths of my childhood. So um, let's look at the myths in software. Uh, our beliefs about software are rooted in an idealized view that came from a simpler era, like the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, that's long enough ago that we can reflect back and, and ask, have we evolved since then? Um, so if you ask, uh, Mama, where does software come from? The answer is likely to be, ah, professional programmers. They create software by writing code in, in provably sound programming languages to satisfy a formal specification and verify the program is correct. Uh, and software, software comes from taking a bunch of these programs and sticking them together. Um, and I hear snickering, and that's good, uh, because um, I want to now walk through and point out the things that you are snickering about uh, that are dissonances uh, with respect to this story that they tell ourselves. So here are some myths that, that come out of, hey, mama, where does programming come from? Um, there it is. Well, first, uh, professional programmers. Um, yes, there are professional programmers. Uh, the professional programmers are vastly outnumbered by what I'll call vernacular programmers, that is, people who are writing code because it's in their way to write code because they're trying to do something else. Uh, and they're not highly trained as professional programmers. They vastly outnumber the professional programmers. So myth one is about the professional programmer. Uh, then there's the business about software uh, being just composing program modules. Um, if you've, uh, if you've looked at what's running on your computer recently, there's a lot of other stuff going on. It's not just writing program modules and sticking them together. So there's myth two. Um, we have a, a myth of mathematical tractability. Uh, there's a, a large segment of the programming language community that what I, for I think are, are good and, and sufficient reasons are really interested um, in how uh, strongly, um, how sound a mathematical base you can have and grow a programming language out of it. There's also a community of programming language uh, researchers who are interested in, in expressibility. Um, and the, the notion that, that all programs should be written in a mathematically tractable way um, is a myth that we wrestle with. Uh, <clears throat> then uh, the business about correctness. Um, I've lived for years with people saying if a program isn't correct, it's useless. And uh, if you believe that, I ask you do, you, uh, do you have with you a cell phone or a computer? Okay, and is it correct? Okay, so much for that. And then there's the business about uh, uh, doing this from formal specifications, because after all, 
proving a program correct is really showing consistency of the code and the specification. And if there's no specification, then, then this consistency is a, a real challenge. So um, those three together, uh, I will call the programming language purity myths because they interact with each other in a strong way. And finally, uh, there's a myth that has come to us in the last uh, very small number of years, which is that AI is special. Uh, AI here really means machine learning. And the, the myth is that, that machine learning is so different from code that we can forget about software engineering. We have to have, to have AI engineering, which will take care of all, all the problems, and we can forget about software engineering. So those are the, the software myths. And uh, what I want to say to you today is that the world has evolved. Those old myths no longer suffice. Um, and that, that um, you know, I, I know that everyone here has, has uh, accepted some pieces of these and we're working around them. But I think what we're doing is, tr is treating the facts in the world, the facts on the ground, um, as, as irregularities or exceptions. And I'm making a pitch that we should look at them as phenomena that we should treat in a first class way, in the same way as we have treated pure code in the past. Okay, um, so let's begin with the myth of the professional programmer. Um, the myth is that professional developers are trained professionals. They have math and logic skills. They will spend lots of time learning languages and the models from languages, and they write code to formal specifications or at least to, uh, to documented APIs. That's the myth uh, in practice. As I mentioned, there are vernacular developers who create code for their own goals. They start with an idea, not with a specification. They're often coding to figure out what the idea should be, to flesh out the idea. They may not think of themselves as doing programming, um, and they uh, often do not have and do not want extensive training in programming and programming languages. Um, and there are many of them, like an order of magnitude more than there are of professionally trained programmers. Um, so these vernacular developers, uh, they are creating software for their own goals. They outnumber us. And they think in the concepts of their own domains, uh, not in the concepts that we teach in, in programming courses. Uh, they often develop software by trial and error, uh, and they refine their goals as they go. And uh, they use not so much full up programming languages as scripts and macros and sets of formulas and subroutine libraries and constraints. They do it with graphical tools. They do it with follow me scripting. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, let me introduce Frida. Uh, Frida was interviewed by Margaret Burnett and Frida's a real person. Uh, Frida manages her department's budget spreadsheets. Um, each year she gets a new company budget spreadsheet and she has to figure out what she did to it last year to make it work for her department and then do the same, except they can't be the same because the base spreadsheet is different, to, to make changes to the new one to generate this year's department spreadsheet. Um, and she has to do it by rediscovering uh, last year's changes and by trial and error. Um, there's a lot of Fridas around. Um, then the, uh, there are scientific programmers. Uh, scientists often create software uh, to help them understand phenomena. And they do a lot of scripting. They do a lot of data handling. They have calls to elaborate specialized libraries. And they develop incrementally with spot checks at every step. Um, often they use visualizations. And this exploratory development style uh, brings the code and the continents of the code is really describing the phenomena. Uh, in parallel. And so Greg Wilson described it to me this way, um, a common workflow for data analysis pipelines in Jupyter um, or in the RStudio IDE is you load the data and visualize it. You say that looks fine. So you filter it some and check there aren't any uh, not applicables. Uh, that looks fine. So replace the check, uh, do a summarization step, take another step, check it, take another step, check it. Are you believing what you're seeing? Now remember, there's no Oracle. So there's no, no formal test for correctness here. Um, and then I'll pick Photoshop as uh, an example of scripting. Uh, Photoshop uh, allows um, essentially macros that you, uh, you produce by doing uh, follow me, uh, you know, start recording, do what I do. 
uh, and you could record these actions for future replay, but the context in which you're doing that recording is, is captured in myriad unexpected and unhelpful ways as, as described in the piece of documentation uh, that comes with Photoshop. Uh, and so they have, uh, in particular, scope issues, but they're not getting any help from the programming language community in managing the scope issues uh, as they think about recording the macros. Um, so much for the professional programmer myth. Now, let's talk about whether the code is the software. So the, the myth uh, about code and software is that big programs are closed systems. That is, you know what's in them, and they only change when you decide you want to make a change. Uh, and they are composed from smaller code modules that interact via procedure calls. Um, and we somehow delegate data to the database people because we don't care about data. Uh, the behavior of the code depends only on the code, <clears throat> plus things that the code invokes explicitly, uh, like libraries and system calls, and those change only uh, with the knowledge of the programmer. Uh, does this sound familiar? Does it sound unfamiliar? Well, that's the myth, um, and in practice, uh, modern software, I think, might be better described as a coalition than a system um, in the sense of a political coalition that if everybody stays in agreement that uh, the system will fly together, but if any member of the coalition uh, di digresses, then things fall apart. Um, data is really significant, and um, as, as ML takes over the world or tries to take over the world, it becomes more significant. Um, in fact, writing code is now just a small part of professional developers' jobs. Uh, as for the vernacular programmers, they mostly use tools other than general purpose programming languages. Um, so, <clears throat> for professional developers, software is no longer just closed systems with known specialized parts. Um, anytime you embark on something or another as a service, uh, you are enlisting a third-party element if you're getting it off the web, it probably doesn't even have a specification. Uh, you have some hopes for what it may do, uh, but, but verifying that um, is, for the most part, really hard. Um, and systems themselves have uh, scripts and huge data sets. Uh, they have code in multiple languages. They have real-time data feeds, automatic updates in the background, <clears throat> distributed processing, and a variety of other things that <clears throat> um, Thank you for leaving me water here. <clears throat> a variety of other things that, um, that aren't just code. So I will suggest that these are really more coalitions than they are systems. Uh, for example, uh, Stack Overflow does a, a survey every now and again. Uh, this is a piece of one of their surveys about uh, the tools used uh, for web development in Microsoft technologies. It's a, a snippet of a larger, a larger display. And you will see that, that there's an ecosystem here uh, that involves <clears throat> platforms, frameworks, IDEs, and databases, as well as languages. Um, they tend to cluster around applications, and so this is the web development and, and Microsoft technology applications. And most of the languages, in fact, are domain-specific languages, not general-purpose languages. And most of the DSLs have not been rigorously designed. They don't have formal semantics. Um, and um, you're sort of on your own. Um, in addition, uh, almost half a century ago, uh, Duramer and Crone recognized that uh, the configuration of modules into systems uh, was not supported by traditional languages. Uh, they wrote the classic paper, Programming in the Small versus Programming in the Large. Uh, they offered a notation that was basically provides requires for program modules, but, but they took the first big step in the research community to say there's something, going, something more going on here than just code. And this has evolved into notations for system configurations and software architectures. Uh, but the integration of these with programming languages remains a little tenuous. Now, the vernacular developers, uh, they don't have or want extensive training. Um, they uh, use lots of different tools and notations. They may not even have a static symbolic text for their program. Um, they need support that matches the domain model models. 
uh, and they need they need much better language support than the programming language community has been giving them. When I say they don't have uh, uh, a lot of training, um, the Stack Overflow survey uh, shows that uh, that only a modest fraction, uh, as I recall, less than half, um, have uh, undergraduate degrees in computer science. Uh, that a lot of them have have picked it up someplace along the line, gone to boot camps. Uh, and they certainly uh, have not uh, acquired a lot of mathematical sophistication in the process. Uh, so what do they do? Uh, well, this is uh, uh, coming up on 15 years old. Uh, this is a web mashup from 2008 uh, that uh, uh, geolocated uh, um, reports of, uh, of voting problems on, on a map. Um, and the mash mashup displayed wait times uh, and this was this dates to before the mapping applications provided APIs. Uh, th th these were mashups by by screen scraping and and uh, and intuition and experimentation. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that vernacular programmers have to do. Um, another uh, another thing that uh, vernacular programmers may do is write uh, systems of constraints. Uh, so AutoCAD is a, a very sophisticated parametric constraint system for graphically defining 3D models. And you, you give it shapes and you put constraints down like this line is this long, this angle is like this, this is twice the length of that, these two things are parallel. Um, and the, the constraints uh, may be formulas that interact with other constraints. And uh, I was never particularly good at AutoCAD, but when I was using AutoCAD, I knew I was programming because the constraints interact with each other. So for example, um, um, here is a, a rectangle and a square with some constraints. This says that these two lines are equal and parallel and that the length of this one is two. And if I change this two to a three, then all the other constraints cause the diagram to twitch around to try to simultaneously satisfy all the constraints. Um, this is one of many things that might happen uh, because the system is under constraint. And, and so as an AutoCAD uh, uh, designer, AutoCAD programmer, uh, you're regularly surprised by, by what happens when you make some small change. Um, AutoCAD has much more than that, by the way, but, but, but the programming aspect of AutoCAD is, is one of writing constraints, and the constraints are all embedded in the diagrams. It's not like you could look at a long list of them. And, and finally, uh, we have the new uh, development of low-code or even no-code development platforms uh, where the shortage of highly skilled developers is, uh, is leading to tools uh, that let non-programmers build certain kinds of things. Uh, Gartner consultants uh, think 65% of applications are going to be developed this way within a few years. Man. Um, there are so many risks uh, associated with trying to uh, make a production system out of bits and pieces that you pull together graphically without understanding what's going on behind. They need better tools. They need better languages than what we're giving them. So this takes me to uh, the programming language purity myths. Um, there are three, as you recall. Uh, mainstream programming language research um, really focuses on symbolic notations, precise specifications, well-defined semantics uh, that allow you to, uh, to, to build provably support solutions to well-specified problems. And so I pointed out three specific uh, myths that we, that we live with that grow out of this, uh, mathematical tractability, correctness, and specifications, and they, they interact with each other. So let's take them in turn. Uh, the mathematical tractability myth uh, says that languages are general, they are rich, they are sound, they are complete, uh, they are uh, Turing complete, they are fully expressive, they have rich abstraction mechanisms, um, and that we reason with them using formal logics. Uh, and it turns out that if you want to use languages like that, uh, you need good math and logic skills, and so you assume that your programmers have those skills. Uh, we've been doing this for years. I remember uh, shortly after Dijkstra and Hoare introduced, uh, and Floyd introduced elementary concepts of program verification, 
uh, that we were talking about how all programmers would have to, uh, to master first order logic as a bare minimum for, for entry to the game. And uh, that is swimming upstream against the tide. We, we never succeeded uh, and I suspect we never will. So that's the myth. In practice, uh, a minority of professional programmers studied formal math, let alone retained it. Um, and uh, languages that they use uh, support code and modules, uh, but they don't have much language help with high level system abstractions um, like architectures. And for also for good reason, uh, domain specific languages uh, trade generality for power. So you know we've known we've known for a long time about about trade-offs between generality and power. We sometimes talk about the the, the power curve. If you have something that is fully general, um, it applies fully everywhere, um, but it may not give you a whole lot of power um, as a result. Uh, as you add more mechanism for more specific things, you get more power for the things that you're adding mechanism for. Um, at the expense of power elsewhere. And so if you, if you get a highly specialized domain-specific language, think about AutoCAD, um, it, it gives you a lot of support for doing that thing and not much support for doing something else. And so uh, in the world, we, we trade the, the generality of general purpose languages for the specific power of domain-specific languages. But I think the programming language community has not stood up to the challenge of bringing the things that we know about the design of programming languages to the domain-specific languages. Um, and in failing to do so, uh, we deprive the vastly larger number of people who are trying to do that kind of thing of the benefits uh, of things we know how to do. Um, so uh, here are two comments on, on mathematics requirements. Uh, one is from a quite senior uh, developer with a PhD from a really good place uh, who wished to remain anonymous. Um, he said, over several years, I have tried and failed to learn functional programming because that means learning a big pile of applied category theory. Uh, despite claims that I can just use the parts I do understand, I find that reusing common libraries like web serving entails understanding the advanced stuff because it's revealed in their interfaces. The abstractions are not fully sealed, sealed up. Uh, so this, this is no slouch. This is a, this is a senior developer, um, and he, he struggles. Um, and then Don Syme, um, uh, talking about adding features, uh, said if you add some feature or another, then programmers who are uninterested in some particular kind of higher math are disempowered. I don't want F-sharp uh, sign system uh, to be the kind of language where the most empowered person in the Discord chat is the category theorist. Um, so there are, there are opinions from a couple of quite respectable uh, software developers and researchers um, on the state of math requirements. And it's not just the math about the reasoning of the about the code and the language. Uh, we, the need for mathematical tractability goes far beyond that. Uh, we need to reason beyond the module boundaries uh, about the properties of the system as a whole, uh, about the way the modules interact, and about the emergent properties uh, that the system as a whole uh, creates, uh, where, for example, a, a safety or security property might be violated if a particular module violates it. Uh, and so you can, you can only reason about the, the safety or security of the system as a whole um, if you can, can manage the aggregate. Uh, we tried UML for this. Um, UML is a, a collection of, uh, of notations. Uh, each notation in the suite had a purpose. Um, they mostly had a formal basis. But the suite was incomplete. Um, I have, um, in other forums, uh, talked about ways in which uh, the UML suite is incomplete. Um, and it didn't, and, 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 and the thing that always frustrated me about UML is that it didn't handle interactions between the languages within the UML suite. So if I had several views of a software system in UML and I made a change in one of them, that change couldn't be propagated uh, to the other ones. Uh, there were some pairs where I could at least be alerted that something had, uh, had become inconsistent. 
Uh, but UML, um, as far as I could tell, was never a complete suite uh, in which the changes that you made in one place could, could be properly associated with, uh, with descriptions in the other. Um, and then, uh, uh, anybody here program an IBM 360? Yes, yes. Uh, write JCL code? Yes, yes. Um, this is the job control language, uh, the, the cards that you put on the front of the deck to tell the operating system what to do, you know, take this deck and put right it on this tape, mag tape, um, and so forth. Um, it was designed at the same time as PL1, uh, but in a different place. Um, and uh, uh, Fred Brooks reported in, I mean, you, you all know the Mythical Man Month. Um, do you all know that a few years ago he published another book called Design of Design, where he, where he does for software design what he had done for software management? Um, it, it, it's a great book. I recommend it. Um, I am, uh, I'm sad to report that, uh, that Fred passed away last month. Um, anyway, uh, he, in Design of Design, he talks about JCL and about the design decisions that went into JCL. Uh, it was a scripting language for batch jobs. Um, and it was so hard to learn that people just blindly copied working sets of cards. Um, it worked for you? Okay, I'll shape my program so it'll work for me. Uh, it forced all the programmers to use a second language that was not well documented and not well designed. Um, the uh, operator set that is, its verbs were not well matched for the complexity of, of the task. It provided no iteration, almost no bra branching, and the liturgy of shortcomings goes on. Um, and Brooks said the biggest flaw of all was that JCL is indeed a programming language, but it was not perceived as such by its designers. And since it was not perceived as such by its designers, it was hacked together um, rather than designed uh, using the principles that we have learned for, for programming languages of other kinds. Um, so we have uh, a generality power trade-off. Um, in striving for generality, uh, the mainstream traditional programming languages about which we uh, so often do most of our research, they miss the opportunity uh, to provide the same kind of formal rigor for the domain-specific languages that support particular applications or programming methods. Um, and it's not just that rigor and formality are only useful at the most general case. Rigor and formality are useful at all points on the generality power curve, um, but we've, we're falling down on the job of, uh, of sharing them. Um, so then, uh, then this is related to the correctness myth, uh, which is software can be provably correct. And that the specifications uh, that we use in proving software to be provably correct are sufficient, complete, homogeneous, static, and purely functional. Um, you'll notice that a lot of those things are at variance with software in the world, like static, purely functional, homogeneous. Mm -hmm. So that's the myth. Um, in practice, proving correctness is usually too expensive. Uh, it's very hard. Um, and it's incomplete because you can only prove correctness as a consistency between the specification and the code. And things that are not um, mentioned in either the specification or the code can fall by the wayside. Uh, full, full, full formal specifications are also probably uh, too expensive especially if you recognize that properties other than functionality should be part of the specification. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to suggest that there's a notion that I want to call credentials that are uh, the things that we know about a piece of software or, or the things that be we believe we want about a piece of software, that they're incomplete, um, they're heterogeneous, that is some of them are mathematical, some of them are narrative, some of them are expressed in other models, uh, that they're evolving as we learn more about the code um, that they are, everybody likes to say we have non-functional properties. To me, non-functional property means, oh, it's not working. Um, so I try to call these extra functional properties, meaning properties beyond functionality. Uh, and I know I'm crying in the wilderness, but I'm crying again. 
Um, and the things we know about programs are also non-monotonic. Uh, we, we think we believe things and then we get uh, evidence from, from use in practice and discover that it doesn't really work that way and so we, we reformulate the things we know. Um, so the information that we're using uh, has variable confidence and variable provenance. That is, we get it from different places. Maybe some from mathematical proofs, maybe some from uh, empirical observations, maybe some by inference from, uh, from some other components. So I, I, I believe that uh, there is part of the world where, where correctness matters, but that there is a vastly larger part of the world in which fitness for intended purpose is really the objective we should pursue. Um, specifications require us to be certain. Real software is uncertain, not just because we haven't reasoned well about it, uh, but even verified modules execute in unverified environments. Um, our understanding of the requirements co-evolves with the development of the software. A lot of the, the, the stuff we're using is, is third-party components that are living out there in the cloud and they're updated without notice by people and we have no idea who they are. Uh, there's also intrinsic uncertainty in software and physical systems because, because the, the mechanics of, uh, of operating a mechanical device um, have intrinsic physical uncertainty. And so if you say, move the arm to there, you don't know that it's exactly there. You have to, to figure out what small corrections you need to make. Um, and even more than that, solutions to societal problems don't even have consensus definitions. Um, and I invoke here the, uh, the Riddle and Weber, Weber paper, uh, dilemmas in something about social planning that we all call the Wicked Problems paper. Uh, so so these, these are examples of why we cannot expect to have a specification. We have to find another way to, dis to decide when we have done enough and when we can turn it loose. And indeed, good enoughness depends on um, how bad it will be if it fails, and whether we're going to notice that it's about to fail before it fails. Um, uh, Marcia Chachik gave a recent keynote uh, about assurance cases for compliance with safety standards and pointed out that they rely on combinations of test cases and proofs and human judgment. So, uh, here's, a, here's a way to think about uh, the, the, the risks involved. Uh, you can think about the consequences of failure. Uh, is it going to be a catastrophe or an inconvenience? Uh, and what degree of oversight do we have? Is there going to be full human oversight and manual intervention, or is it going to be full automation turned loose? And so we have, uh, you know, finding a restaurant or finding a movie down in the low consequence of failure, high degree of somebody will notice that there's a problem corner. And uh, automatic shutdown of nuclear devices, uh, you know, your nuclear power plant automatic shutdown up in the upper corner. Um, and uh, I note that there's potentially a problem with mission creep where you start off doing something and, and get it more and more automated, like automobile cruise control, moving to advanced cruise control to self-driving cars. Um, but uh, there is a realm in which correctness really matters. Uh, and there is a realm in which good enough is okay. So uh, the classical programming language and classical software engineering uh, activities tend to be um, in, this, in this upper corner uh, where correctness is all. But the huge volume of software that real people use for real things um, is in the, in the lower corner uh, where good enough is good enough and where... Um, your own interaction is the, the, the thing you've got to fall back on because you don't, you don't have better. Okay, so vernacular developers, uh, they often program to figure out what they really need. That is, they're working toward a specification rather than from a specification. Uh, they may have very little training or systematic support for reasoning about programs. And without a specification, they can't use many correctness techniques anyway. And so they are left with little alternative than to look for plausible behavior. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunity here uh, to help them do better. Let's go back to Frida. Uh, you recall Frida has to adapt the company's budget. 
Um, she has to reverse engineer changes. Um, cut and paste doesn't work because of the peculiar binding rules in spreadsheets. You can't just pick up this formula and drop it there because they've changed the lines and the columns and the thing that you got from the company this year. What she's really trying to do um, is compose two transformations. Uh, the transformation last year between the, the, the company and the department and the transformation this year between the, the old and the new in the company. Um, and uh, what she wants to do is, is build the new transformation, but Frida doesn't even have the concept of a mathematical transformation. Um, so she, she's not getting any help with, with making this happen. Uh, and now let's look at the specification myth. Uh, specification myth says that uh, full, preferably formal specifications are possible, uh, and that some kind of requirement or specification should precede the writing of the software. Uh, that's the myth. Uh, in practice, we have vernacular programmers uh, writing programs to discover requirements, not just to implement them. Uh, Greg Wilson again on, on scientific programming. Um, recall that, that this is, we, we try a little, uh, we, we like what we've got, we add a little more, we like what we got, we add a little more, we like what we've got. Um, however, he says, if you're simulating a rapidly rotating black hole, the entire reason that you're writing the code is that there isn't a closed form equational solution for this. So there's no oracle. Uh, so how do scientists create software to help them understand a phenomenon? Um, they have heuristics and spot checks um, and they interact with it until they have uh, a personal conviction uh, or a conviction within the group uh, that they're getting the right answers. Um, and remember, those spot checks don't leave traces and may not be rerunnable. And if they're visualizations, then they probably evaporate. Uh, so traditional testing and unit testing is just not designed for this uh, situation. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll invoke uh, uh, Donald Schoen, uh, uh, one, of, one of the people we look to for, for uh, um, insights about design. Um, when you look at vernacular programmers, uh, you see a, a pattern of incremental and opportunistic exploration. Um, contrast this with traditional programming. Pr traditional programming, you get a problem specification, you commit problem solving on it, um, you, get, you get a result. The exploratory model is one of problem setting. Um, I'm trying to figure out what the problem is um, and then I can worry about problem solving. These are two contrasting views of design. Um, I grew up uh, with, with Herb Simon's view of design as problem solving. I've come in later years to understand Schoen's view of design as problem setting. Um, and and Schoen uh, says, I shall consider designing as a conversation with the materials. The designer makes things. Uh, sometimes he makes a product. Sometimes he makes a plan. Um, he, uh, he sharpens his intuition by, by looking at it in context, asking what the materials will do, um, and, and evolves to the definition of the problem from there. Um, this is a side of programming that, that uh, doesn't carry the same legitimacy as problem solving uh, to our detriment. Um, okay. So this brings us to the AI revolution myth. Um, the myth is that AI, uh, which really means machine learning, um, these systems are so different from conventional systems that we need a brand new software discipline to cope with them. Um, big argument is the dominance of data, but there's also opacity, non-determinism, inadequate specifications, unpredictable component interactions, and a whole litany of other things. That's the myth, but I say um, AI, not ML, AI, uh, has a long history as an incubator of disruptive programming techniques. Uh, they invent things. They're not worried about efficiency. They, they figure out how to do things. They hand them to us. We say, oh, my. Uh, and then we figure out how to tame them. And then we forget that we got them from AI. Um, and I think the, the machine learning challenges resemble things that software engineering has seen before, um, except the data is much more prominent. So just just to back up my claim that, that AI has, uh, has been uh, throwing stuff over the wall to us for years. List processing. In late 1950s, 
uh, running on uh, IBM 709s and 704s and 7094s, um, when you built a list uh, and you put a, a link in half the word, you only had half the word left for data, and throwing away half of your 32K memory uh, for, for linking, that was stunning. Uh, but now we think nothing about lists. Um, mathematics as a programming language came from AI. That was LISP also, which brought us functional programming. Um, AI was the mainstay of search long before we had Google. Uh, exploratory programming, um, I first learned about in expert systems. Uh, these are production systems with condition action pairs. I said, oh, what they're doing is writing a bunch of, of reactive things and they're programming by approximation. They run it and say, hmm, not working. Let's throw in some more. Um, so I, I learned that from AI. I think we probably mostly got it there. And then the, the notion of design as problem solving uh, came, from, uh, came from Simon, uh, which in some quarters eclipsed the complementary notion of problem setting. Uh, so we've been getting things from AI for years. So now we have machine learning uh, that we've just received from AI. Well, the, the concerns involve uh, uh, big data, opacity, non-determinism, inadequate specifications, unpredictable component interaction, dynamic change, correctness, and other extra functional properties. You know, it's all very mushy. Uh, but we have addressed similar issues, not the same, but similar issues in the past. And I argue that we can draw on the things that we already know how to do and evolve those techniques uh, to address these problems. And uh, I actually hope that, that this is going to be the big thing that forces us to come to grips uh, with the, the, met, the myths um, and, and break the myths and evolve beyond them uh, to, to, uh, to address more of real software outside of machine learning as well. So the big thing with, uh, with ML is the collection and curation of large data sets. Um, the code is a software emit, uh, largely ignores data, but, but we've always known that there are those databases over there on the other side handling the data. Um, data quality involves quite intense curation about a lot of different kinds of threats. Um, the data may be incorrect. There might be malicious errors. Uh, it might be ill-formed. You get a big bucket load of data and you're expecting natural language and there's a bunch of JPEGs in there. Uh, the data may be inconsistent. Uh, as data in the real world often is. Um, these have new wrinkles in machine learning, but they are familiar problems to us. And um, I think the problem of algorithmic bias is not unique uh, to AI, although the, its application in large data sets um, is of, of contemporary interest. Um, but but um, if we have biased sources or, or biased algorithms, we're bound to get biased results. Um, as an example, uh, electronic medical records have astonishingly high error rates. Um, there was a, a study of patient review. They gave doctor's notes to patients to review. And 20% of the patients found mistakes in the, the snippet that they had just been given to review. And 40% of those errors were serious. Uh, there was another study in which they uh, tried to aggregate records about a particular patient within a hospital system. Um, it, was, uh, it could be as low as 80% uh, uh, or as low as 50%. So it's just very difficult to bring the data together. And there's an additional problem that uh, electronic medical records have a prominence that the medical community knows how to deal with. It's coming from doctors and, and, and diagnostic machines. When we start adding health records, the information that, that people collect from you know, their wrists and, and so forth, the provenance is, is much less reliable. And so understanding how to combine data with different levels of, of, of veracity uh, becomes an additional problem. Um, um, who's wearing a wrist-worn wrist heart rate monitor? Um, are you aware that 95% uh, of, the, of the readings are only uh, within 35 to 40% of uh, what the EKG would tell you? Mm. Um, so there, there's some unnerving aspects of machine learning. There's, there's the opacity. 
Um, but I will say to you, we don't understand conventional components either. We, we tell ourselves that that third party thing that we downloaded uh, off the web, uh, if we could get the source code, uh, oh, well, it's open source, so I can get the source code. If I read the source code carefully, I could understand what it does. Uh, but practically speaking, uh, it's not going to happen. We, we don't actually understand the conventional components. Uh, Non-determinism and dynamic uh, change from fresh data, just ordinary embedded and third-party components are dynamic. Um, Non-determinism arises anytime you touch something mechanical. Um, lack of, of specifications. Um, systems in the real world, as I argued a few minutes ago, really have something more like a credential than they have like a specification. So we haven't got specifications of them either. And we have figured out what to do about it. Unpredictable defects, hidden dependency, feature interaction, we study those things. Um, and criteria for correctness and bias, uh, we have to think about whether the standard of accuracy is, is correctness, fitness for task, adherence to societal norms, or something else. And, and those, are, those are things that we can do within software engineering. So the argument I'm making here is, is similar to an argument that uh, Shapiro and Varian made in a book called Information Rules maybe 20 years ago. Um, at the time, it was, oh, computing technology is so different that we need a new economics. Uh, they're economists. They said, we don't need a new economics. The old economics works just fine, but the parameters are different. So don't throw away all the things that we knew figure out how to tune them up, how to evolve them, and figure out what the new parameters are, and then go ahead and use the apparatus that we've already got. And I'm, I'm echoing that argument here. So to bring uh, machine learning into the software engineering fold, it is certainly the case that ML models are new kinds of elements of software systems. And there's a lot of innovative engineering and machine language required to bring them in from being research prototypes to being a product quality. But once you have brought them into a software system, there's a lot of other stuff in the software system. And the other stuff, the interactions of components, the, the reliability, um, the uh, robustness, um, we already have rich concepts and theories that apply broadly. Uh, and they are a great starting point for innovating the integration of the machine language component into the systems we're already using. Uh, so the software is still system software. It's got components of different kinds. And if you think that ML has been disruptive, just wait, because hiding right around the corner and about to pop out um, is quantum computing. Um, and if you, think, uh, if you think ML has brought challenges, uh, uh, wait for quantum computing. You know, what are the semantics? What are you going to do if you get probability clouds as results? Uh, what constitutes correctness? Uh, how do you manage quantum entanglement in a software system? Um, so um, AI is not the end. There will always be something around the corner that will challenge us, and we should be prepared to rise to the occasion. And so. Um, I'll wrap up. Uh, our myths should inspire us because we have learned an enormous amount from traditional programming languages, from ways of reasoning about them, from the, the methods of developing software. But they shouldn't hold us captive uh, because what we've done in the past does not cover anywhere near the full range of things that we need to do. Uh, so it's time to be bold uh, about not treating uh, the lapses, the shortfalls of the, 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 the myths um, as, as little ugly things in the corner. It's time to bring them up front and say, let's, let's tackle them directly. Um, to recap, there were um, six myths. The myth of the professional programmer, the myth that the code is the software, the purity myths of tractability, correctness, and specifications, and the myth that AI is special. And I've taken each of those um, and, uh, and reinterpreted it uh, to say that uh, uh, vernacular software developers outnumber skilled, highly professional programmers, uh, that software systems are big coalitions of diverse things, not just buckets of symbolic program text linked together. 
that task-specific expressiveness is more important than, uh, than completeness or soundness in many, many, but I hasten to add, not all cases, um, that some programming is exploratory and is actually in search of the right specifications, um, and that, that as, uh, as machine learning is, is coming into the mainstream, uh, that the issues of, of concern are issues that are similar to issues we have already tackled. We already have models and techniques for dealing with them, and we should uh, uh, vigorously um, uh, adapt those models to the new challenges. Um, so for the programming language designers here, since this is UFLU, um, here's some things to think about. Can you support the background and the mindset of your intended users? Um, can you design languages that actually do hide the complexity in the higher math? Recall the very senior anonymous developer uh, who would really like to engage in more functional programming, but the category here theory keeps leaking out. Um, how, can, how can you seal up that stuff and, and, and keep it under the covers? Particularly for the vernacular programmers, I have less sympathy with, uh, with my, uh, my highly educated colleague. Um, what can we do to better support exploratory programming uh, that, that develops software incrementally as we understand the task better? Um, and, and in particular, can we uh, augment programming languages to develop techniques for helping people decide when, when they have achieved good enough? Um, can we provide better support for the little languages? Can we, can we provide better language support for scripting and mashups and, and constraint sets and graphical tools? Um, and can we enrich our type systems uh, to handle untidy data and track provenance? Uh, and start thinking about what it means to have a type system in which the types are probability clouds. Um, so our, our myths give us insight into better understanding our world. And what I've tried to do is, 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 is shine the light of the world onto the myths um, and see, see what challenges open up. I, I think we, we cling to those myths. Uh, our need for myths uh, arises from our need for certainty. Um, and certainty can certainly be found within formal systems. Uh, and they are and were and will remain important. But the world out there is uncertain. It's messy, it's non-deterministic, it's ambiguous, exploratory, it's full of human beings. Um, and so we need to augment the techniques that we have for the, the formal mathematical world uh, with techniques that can translate with confidence um, into the world of, of real people and real things. Uh, while still aspiring to precision and correctness, but having some, some reasonable waypoints along the way. And so I'll leave you with this thought. Um, I, we probably all grew up with some kind of method, method, mythology. Um, I grew up with, with the Greeks and the Romans and the Norse, and that, that's, that's how it was for me. Many of you grew up with different myths. And so I'll invite conversation through the conference uh, about how the myths from our cultures inform our views of innovation, of aspiration, of hubris, of unintended side effects um, of success. Can, can we learn from these bits of our own culture and, and can we perhaps exchange uh, in the conference those insights? Uh, so our myths should inspire us. They shouldn't hold us captive. And so roll credits. <laughs> We have time for uh, two or three questions uh, for Mary. Uh, James Noble, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, it seemed to me a lot of what you were doing, though, was setting up um, perhaps another myth of your own, um, in that on one side, literally of your slides, the left-hand side we have the, uh, the bad professional programmers, and on the right-hand side we have programming for the rest of them. Do you think this is actually as hard a binary distinction as, as, as you presented? Um, or do you think that's the purpose of presentation right. and, in fact, things may be more flexible? 
No, actually, actually, I I, I don't think it's uh, it's uh, professional programmers versus the rest of the world. I think it's uh, the the rest of the world uh, does largely reside on the right hand side, uh, but uh, professional programmers um, um, also often work in exploratory mode. Uh, they often use domain specific languages that are not uh, well supported. Uh, recall the, the uh, um, ecosystem for web development that, uh, that I showed from Stack Overflow. Um, their, their full collection of tools that programmers use was much too big. I just took a snippet out. Um, so the professional developers themselves um, also need uh, better tools for, for example, uh, scripting in domain-specific languages. Uh, we still don't have good architecture notations. Um, the, uh, uh, what, we, what we know about a piece of software um, is not, almost, is, is almost never uh, verified to its specification. It, it's based on uh, things that we have learned from the software development, things that we have learned from the software in use. Um, and we, we have uh, given very, very little thought to how we recognize the bits, the, 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 the snippets of information that we have about a software component and associate it with the component um, and keep track of where we learned it uh, and how much we trust it. Uh, and one of the reasons we need that is compositionality. So if, if I have a, I'll call it a credential to avoid having an argument about what is the specification with my formal colleagues, um, if we have a credential that says uh, some fact about a component, and I use that component um, in, in a system, um, then in reasoning about that system, I've probably done some compositional argument on the information that I had about the component. Okay, now if I discovered that that piece of information is wrong, I should propagate uh, that new information uh, to the remainder of the system. Um, and we, we have uh, very, very little clue about how to do that. Um, so... Uh, it is surely the case that the professional programmer is sitting on the uh, submethos side, but it is absolutely the case that this professional programmer is also sitting on the sepragmo side. Hi, thank you for a, a, a very insightful talk. I appreciated uh, um, the excalpatory approach to our myths, and I largely agree with uh, the things you said. Um, in my life outside of my professional life, there are myths that um, have a very positive, but things I think you would call myths that have very positive um, impact on like the community around me and the sets of values that we hold together. And so um, I wonder if your study of our myths have revealed anything that you see can uh, strengthen the community instead of, in the, instead of things to be discarded or, or adapted or changed somehow. Well, I, I, I certainly believe that the, um, the, the mainstream work on mainstream programming languages has set us up with a set of tools that we can adapt and apply. Um, and I think that's, that's a very positive thing. Um, I, um, to the extent that we have uh, brought into our fold uh, things like the, the real lessons of the, um, of the Wicked Problems paper. Um, I, I, I've seen Wicked Problem used to me, it's just too hard for me to think about, but, but, but the, the, the essence of the Wicked Problems argument um, is that the world is full of people with their own interests, um, and those interests are inherently in conflict with each other, and that what we need is a way of, of, of uh, creating a discourse that allows us to understand how to find a reasonable reconciliation um, of their interests um, as, we, as we build. So I, I think there are certainly examples like that uh, that are, are very much part of the fold. Uh, so, so yes, I, I appreciate your bringing uh, to the fore uh, the fact that some of the myths are myths of, of cooperation and support. Um, and I, I would love to have more conversations through the conference um, about how those can affect us here as well. We'll have one more final question, thank you. Thanks for a great talk. I, um, when you showed the myth about assuming correctness and full formal specifications, as someone who 
maybe cares too much about correctness. I was laughing when you said that that's a myth. I thought that, no, no one expects that. And this is why we, we toil away and um, feel like we're always running behind the, the trends of what's happening in industry until uh, the Rust programming language, which seems to somehow have gone against the tide of um, the JavaScripts and the, the Pythons and of the world to add more rigor. And somehow for seven years in a row, it's the most popular language or, or the most loved language according to Stack Overflow. So I'm just curious what your feelings are about the, the rare cases when maybe the, the myth that you listed, um, people are moving toward it rather than away from it. Um, I, I, th I think that there is, uh, is merit in, in all of those statements. Um, when they can be made to apply. Um, and, and the example that you cite is one in which uh, the developers of a language have provided something that um, practical software developers find serviceable that also manages to uh, embed the formality in a way that doesn't get in their way. And, and that is uh, one of the principal paths forward that I see. Um, I mean, I, I know in, in civil engineering, um, I know there's one civil engineer in the audience who can, can keep me, uh, keep me uh, honest here. Um, in civil engineering, in an undergraduate program in civil engineering, we still insist that a civil engineer learn calculus um, because we think a civil engineer should learn calculus. Uh, but in practice, when a civil engineer is out committing engineering, um, they're using tools that embed the calculus inside, right? Am I right? Um, does this mean that they shouldn't learn calculus? No, uh, it means they need to know enough calculus that they understand when the tool is working well and when the tool is working not well. But, but what has happened um, in, in some parts of civil engineering is that the tools have embedded the mathematical complexity in the tools so that the abstractions provided by the tools are domain appropriate while still enforcing the mathematics, um, which I think doesn't, doesn't absolve us of, of the need to actually understand what's going on at at least a qualitative level so that we can remain in control. But, but that's an example that, that uh, for years has, 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 has convinced me that one of the things that language designers can do is to try to bridge the gap between the expressiveness needed uh, by the, the practical software developers um, and the, uh, the rigor of the underlying mathematics. So th thank you for the question. Okay, Mary, so, thank you so much thank for you. coming to Splash, right. to Auckland, <laughs> to I would like to thank all the volunteers who have made this technically possible. So, so thank you and, and thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.